How do you measure innovation and why is it important? Well, the Global Innovation Index, ranking 125 countries, does just that. And here with us to tell us why it's important is the author of the report, INSEAD Professor Sumitra Dutta. Sumitra, thank you very much for being with us on INSEAD Knowledge. Why do we need to measure the innovation capacity of all these countries? Why is it important? Innovation today has become an extremely important theme for all countries because both developed and developing countries, they realize that innovation is the only way that they can guarantee the competitiveness going forward. It's also important because innovation is important to inspire young people in a, an economy. In some sense, if a country or an economy doesn't really provide that kind of a capacity to extract the best value of the human intellect that is there inside the population, you really are missing out on a very important growth driver for the economy. What criteria did you use and, and how did you come up with them? Innovation has also innovated in some sense. Historically, we always thought of innovation as being linked very much to science and technology related indicators, aspects like articles published in scientific journals, the number of PhDs, the number of researchers, or the number of, let's say, university patents, and so on. But today, what we're finding is innovation can be in broader areas, for example, social innovation, for example, cultural innovation, or in the case of a firm, business model innovation or marketing innovations. So what we realize is we need a much more broader set of indicators that capture the different diverse elements of innovation. So to do that, what we have done is in the Global Innovation Index framework, we have created two categories of inputs. And one set of inputs relate to aspects that enable an economy to become innovative. And the second set of factors are very much linked to the outputs, evidence of innovation in the economy, both scientific and non-scientific. But some examples are aspects like the kind of political regulatory environment in a country. Uh, these things are important because if it takes a long time to establish a business or you don't have political stability in a country, you might not have the conditions conducive for effective innovation in that economy. You also have factors like uh, the quality of human talent. Uh, it's a question of fundamental investment in human talent because if you don't have that ingredient, you may not have the right kind of supply for the innovation engine in your economy. You're evaluating then emerging or developing countries and industrialized countries. I, I can't believe you get the same kind of data you have, of course, besides the challenge of even having metrics to measure innovation in its current broader definition, you also have the lack of availability of the right kind of data for all the countries you're interested in. So we try our best to have a balance between breadth of coverage and the rigor required for the depth of coverage of any one economy. And we try, we try to strike a balance between the two. And we do a lot of statistical testing to make sure that the results are accurate within certain number of error, uh, let's say, uh, in, the, in the actual ranking of the, of the economies. And that's the reason why we got an audit done of the entire methodology by the Joint Research Commission of the European Union. And they actually, their whole group of experts look at composite indicators, and they have performed a very extensive statistical analysis of a methodology, and they have given us a stamp of approval on the entire approach. And Switzerland came out to be number one. I don't think of Switzerland as being overly innovative. I think of it as being conservative. Well, you know, innovation is, of course, a broad-based phenomenon. So I think uh, the image that one might have of a country or a region may not necessarily be completely consistent. You know, innovation is not only about wearing different colored socks you know, and having long ponytails. Uh, so I think it's important to keep in mind innovation is about economic growth, innovation is about well-being societies, and certainly Switzerland as a country does have many of the key variables. And for me, what is very interesting and very important for us to observe is that innovation is no longer the privilege of the West. So even in the top 10 countries, you see that you have uh, six European economies, you have two North American countries, and you have two uh, Asian economies. And in fact, Singapore 
uh, comes up very high, number three in that, in that list. Now, if you take the top 20 or top 30, you once again see that, of course, there's a predominance of uh, more developed economies, but you see new entrants in this picture coming up very uh, fast. So you see, uh, I think at position number 29 this year, China, and China is an emerging country. It's not a developed economy by any measure. Uh, it's moving into the top 30 positions. So the range of countries that you see in the top 20, 30 is evolving, is shifting. Certainly, we will see more of an influence of the BRIC countries. They are becoming more important globally, and I think you see the impact innovation as a position of China. So can we derive from this report any indication of how a country is doing? Uh, look at the U.S., for example. The U.S. Is a, is a very interesting example also because it's perhaps the only large economy, both in terms of size and in terms of population, um, which is in the top 10. And the U.S. has tremendous strengths and a variety of different input conditions and output results. So America has a very strong position, and I think America has a tremendous amount of momentum behind it, innovation, which will be very difficult to, uh, let's say, uh, see suddenly disappear from the scene. So when you ask the question, can these results be seen as indicators of uh, current and maybe future performance, I would say yes. And I know from experience and from prior uh, years that many companies look at rankings like the Global Innovation Index when they make decisions about which parts of the world to invest more in R&D or which, part, which economies to actually go and form more strategic collaborations. Can I ask you to make a comment about the various regions, Europe for example? Well, in Europe you have an interesting uh, scenario. Or many of the Scandinavian countries, Sweden is ranked number two, they do very well typically. And again, um, these countries or these economies benefit from a range of favorable inputs. And they range, you know, and they include aspects like a very uh, stable macroeconomic climate, they, they include uh, good regulatory environments, they include a very strong uh, focus on education and human capital. Uh, and a relatively sophisticated business environment and a, and a good market environment. So it's not surprising that these economies do very well. So you have a picture in Europe which is a little bit mixed. You have high performance kind of economies in the north. You have, of course, Switzerland and Germany doing quite well. And then you have economies in the south which are not doing as well, but they're, 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 we know that we have traditional problems in many areas and also traditionally they have much lower levels of investments in human capital and other kinds of macroeconomic challenges. The good news is that you have hot spots for innovation all over the world. It's not just a question of one region or one continent. Let's talk about the Middle East. None of those countries are in the top 20, but there's certainly a lot going on there. My own sense is that uh, clearly given the kind of changes which have taken place in the region of the last, uh, let's say, year or less than a year, we will see some kind of a perhaps a slowdown in some economies uh, like for example Egypt Tunisia where there's a transition right now the focus in these economies is very much on managing a political transition as opposed to really investing in you know in, in, in a lot of the key enablers required for innovation and innovation capacity so you might see a small gap but having seen that my own prediction is that if these economies make a good transition to a sustainable basis for the future that is more politically stable, that's more supportive of you know, investment, uh, supportive of uh, innovation, uh, you will see a much further increase and rise in innovation uh, you know, uh, results from these economies even further, much more than what they have achieved in the past. You had four partners in this report. You had Alcatel-Lucent, you had WIPO, you had CII from India, and you had Booz and Company. What happens next? What's going to happen to this report? What do we take away from it all? Well, we are very fortunate indeed to have the support of four very important partners. Uh, in some sense, the World Intellectual Property Organization you know, is the UN agency focused on intellectual property. And certainly we see that the whole role and importance of intellectual property innovation is very important. The links between the two are very critical. So it's very important how the support and the knowledge and the inputs on the WIPO in the process. Uh, we see we have the benefit of we benefit from the inputs from Alcatel Lucent, which is a global 
player in high technology and they produce patents and they produce very innovative uh, products and services and they also contain Bell Lab, one of the most innovative and you know, successful innovative uh, corporate labs in the world. Uh, and then we have uh, CII, which is the Indian Industry Confederation. So CII brings the perspective of a large emerging market player. And then finally, of course, last but not least, we have Booz and & Company. And Booz & Company is a major consulting company that works with corporations and helps them increase their innovation capacities and does themselves very important studies and innovation at the corporate level. So they have also provided us very important perspectives about how these results apply to corporations and how they can be in fact taken forward. So what I do hope is that uh, while we benefited from a knowledge tremendously in the, on the process of preparing this report, so I think the expectation and the hope is that our knowledge partners will uh, take these results and push them forward in their own communities. Uh, what I also hope is that they will be, uh, you know, useful players and partners, you know, with us in the process going forward in the future. And last but not least, let's also not forget that we set up for this year, uh, for the first time, a very important advisory board. And the advisory board uh, comprised of senior representatives from the major global organizations, like, for example, we had the head of uh, CERN, we had the head of ITU, the head of UNESCO, you know, and other very distinguished individuals uh, on, uh, on uh, our advisory board. And I do hope that even advisory board members pick up some of these uh, results. And I certainly do expect that we will be in continuous dialogue with them and we will be able to uh, at least use the results to help change the discussion around innovation going forward around the world. I think it's very important that the discussion that we're having around innovation, the multi-stakeholder engagement required to push innovation forward, uh, changes from a pure science and technology perspective to a much more broader horizontal version in economies around the world. So this kind of work can help to make it happen and can also help give confidence to emerging nations that their results and their success innovation can also be measured and represented more accurately in this kind of studies. Sumitra Dutta, thank you very much for being with us on NCAD Knowledge. Thank you very much.